Welcome to tonight's show, Environmental Issues. My name is Patricia Brady, and uh, I have a pretty interesting show tonight, and I just want to wish everybody, um, you know, Happy New Year 2019, January. So um, the topic tonight is uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and I have a special guest, Tony Rose. Hi, Hi Pat. How Hi, are Tony. you? Hi, Tony. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Wow, it's been a year already since you were here. <laughs> Time goes by fast. Yeah, pages drop off the calendar with alarming regularity. So um, we're going to talk about a very important topic tonight. Um, basically trying to save somebody's life if they need it. And Tony's got a, a whole bunch of stuff that he's going to demonstrate and talk about. And hopefully this will um, maybe enlighten some people to uh, take this topic up and go further with it. So, uh, Tony, I, I, again, I welcome you to the show. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we usually, we're, we're out saving the Graniteville Forest or uh, stopping air pollution or drilling in the Atlantic, but if we don't have people watching your show, if, uh, then what good is doing a show? So let's see if we can keep them glued to the TV instead of pushing up daisies. Something like that. Yeah, Something yeah. Something like that. So this is environmental issues, and it all ties in. You'll, you'll see the tie-in as the uh, show progresses. So, Tony, uh, you have so much information, and I know you, you are an RN. Is that correct? Yes, yes. RN. And uh, you do some of the training for uh, people who want to take some of these courses. I started out, I worked in psych. I enjoyed psych. psych. Wow. I started at South Beach Psych Center. I fought nursing for a long time. I was dating a girl who said, you should be a nurse, you should be a nurse. I said, oh, blood and guts? I don't know about that. And then um, I worked with delinquent girls. I went to South Beach Psych Center and, and found that I enjoyed working, doing activities, working with families, working with kids. And um, I said, oh, I could do this. And then when I got into nursing school, I found if it's not your blood, it's really not so bad. I ended up That's then in true. the emergency room. Emergency room staff development for a while. Um, and then uh, the tail end of the career working in electrophysiology, working in uh, electrical stuff involving the heart, where we implanted pacemakers, defibrillators. Electrophysiology. Electrophysiology. There's two kinds of cardiologists. The, if you need, if you have a blockage in your blood vessel mm -hmm. um, and you need a stent, you go to a plumber. You go to uh, that kind of cardiologist. Now, electrophysiologist is an electrician. If there's a problem with the conduction in your heart, then you need to see an electrician. So I worked with the electrician up in a cath lab with the plumbers. Okay. He's well-rounded. Okay, so uh, tell us a little bit maybe about the history. Okay. Uh, let's go back a little bit in time. And oh, we can go way back because um, people have tried to save people as long as they were people. Um, we... We shouldn't be afraid of the D word. You know, people are afraid to say dead. But the deal is, when you're born, the only thing you know for sure is that at some point you're going to die. The problem is, some people die too soon. 95% of you could be healthy, but this 5% of you in the center of the chest goes haywire and the rest is useless. So, um, cave people. When people died, they would swat their feet with branches to see if they could stimulate them. They would lay them on a bed of leaves and put uh, embers from the fire under them because when you die, you got cold. So they said, well, if we can warm them up, uh, then maybe that'll work. Didn't happen. The Dutch would roll drowned sailors over a barrel. That was their form of resuscitation. Um, in fact, the expression, he's blowing smoke up your butt, is a resuscitation um, illusion. What happened during the colonial era, uh, in a process known as Dutch fumigation, when you died, mm -hmm. people around you would try and, and instill a stimulant, nicotine. They would take nicotine, and the way to do it is um, they would put a bellows in the rectum and hold a burning tobacco leaf in the opening 
and try and push some tobacco smoke, some nicotine smoke into the body. And we know that that works because little kids, we give them Tylenol suppositories. Someone who's seizing, you can't get an IV. You can give them a Valium suppository and the mucous membrane uh, accepts the medication. Um, and every once in a while, somebody who wasn't really dead would wake up. Uh, but for the most part, blowing smoke up your butt became synonymous with a futile gesture. So, and in fact, so what we've moved to, uh, by World War II, we were doing chest compressions. Uh, they did open chest compressions. When you went into cardiac arrest, they would take a scissor or a scalpel and, and tear open the cartilage between your ribs, reach in there and pump the heart, open chest compressions. I'm just gonna interrupt you. Is your microphone okay? Yeah. It, uh, it disappeared. No, it's... It's there? It's there. Okay, it's, it's near the heart. Folks at home, you can hear, right? As um, long as it's near the heart. So, like, oh, dunka, dunka, dunka. so um, what happened by World War II, they were doing closed chest compressions and mouth to mouth. Mm -hmm. Because the way the body works, the heart is, well, here's our high tech, our high tech simulation. The heart sits on your blood vessels and points out into space. So there are four chambers. There's two atria and two ventricles. The atria are a reservoir. The way the, the blood moves is um, the blood comes from the body and goes into the right atria. There's a one-way valve. So when the atria contra contracts, blood goes down into the ventricle and can't come back up. Mm -hmm. When you hear that dunk, 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 Love dunk, dunk. dunk that's the valves snapping shut, so the blood can only go in one direction. Mm -hmm. So it enters the right atrium, goes down to the right ventricle, goes up to the lungs. You drop off the excess CO2, pick up oxygen, and now it goes to the left side of the heart. Now the left side is bigger and stronger, it's the more active pumping part. Hits the left atrium, and the atria collects blood, and in one shot sends a lot of blood down to the left ventricle. That goes into the aorta, which is the, the big vessel that sends the blood to the rest of the body. So your heart beats the atria fire, the ventricle fire, the atria fire, the ventricle fire, about a billion times over the course of your life. Each day, your heart pumps enough fluid to fill a four foot high, 15 foot wide pool. Never takes a break, never goes on vacation, mm -hmm. never takes a day off, except once in a while. Once in a while, what happens if you're normal, well, here's the electrical system. There's a, a pacemaker, a natural pacemaker in the heart the sinus node, it initiates a beat, a wave of contraction goes across the atria, and there's a layer of insulation, so electricity can't get through, except in this one gateway, this one spot, the atrioventricular node. It goes down along the bundles and spreads out throughout the heart, um, so that the whole heart gets the message at the same time, and all the muscle contracts. So the atria fire, the ventricle fire, the atria fire, the ventricle fire. If for some reason there's fraying of the wire, the heart has what's called escape pacemakers. There's areas of tissue all around the heart that can get irritable, could initiate a beat. So if your normal beat stops, this pacemaker will fire and keep the heart going. Now it goes very slow and it's not very strong, but it'll keep you alive long enough for 911 to get you to the hospital and we can put a pacemaker in you, okay? Um, the problem is sometimes the heart gets irritable. Those escape pacemakers, like Catholic school, Two feet on the floor, fold your hands, shut up. Sometimes they get irritable, and people get extra beats. Mm -hmm. And it's not great, but it's not the end of the world. Sometimes one of those pacemakers will initiate a fast heartbeat, a tachycardia, fast heart. So if you have a ventricular tachycardia, the heart's going bop, 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 and running through open fields. Now that's not good. Um, it's not necessarily life-threatening, but it can lead to where we're headed for tonight, ventricular fibrillation. Fibrillation is when the heart quivers and shakes. When all of those escape pacemakers are firing <coughs> asynchronously, they're all firing, and people who have looked at the, cracked the chest and looked at the heart, describe that it looks like a bag of worms. The heart quivers and shakes, you're no longer emptying and filling. Why, emptying and why filling. does something like that happen? It can happen because your heart is irritable. Your heart, let's, let's say, now there's a difference between heart attack and cardiac arrest. What we're talking about tonight is cardiac arrest, when the heart stops. The other word for that is dead. You could have a heart attack. Now, 
I don't know if we can get close enough for this. Um, how well can we zoom? Here's a blood vessel. Now the, good, good, good. The, no, the blood vessel, what happens in your body, there's three layers and you should just have an open area and blood passes through. When you eat a Whopper, you're having some haagen -Dazs. Fat goes into the bloodstream. Now the body doesn't like that. A white blood cell gobbles up that fat and dies for you. And it, it becomes a, just it retreats below the inner lining of the heart, of the, of the, of the blood vessel, and it becomes a, a fatty cyst. So the fat now is out of circulation. But over time, you gotta ask, who ate that haagen -Dazs? You know, the, um, who ate that chocolate chip cookie? The blood vessel opening gets narrower and narrower, mm -hmm. all right? And when you can't get oxygen and nutrients to the parts of the heart that need it, you may experience chest pain. Is and that's a heart attack. What happens, that opening gets narrower and narrower and something, usually a clot, gets in there and closes that blood vessel off. Now, wherever that blood vessel services, now is out of business. Doesn't get oxygen, doesn't get nutrients. That tissue can die, okay? Um, could, it, could it happen to somebody who's obese? Is it more well, prevalent? Well, th certainly the, there's a whole list of risk factors for heart disease. Um, and the big message about risk factors is there's things you can change and things you can't change. Like um, if you're a male, males, get heart disease earlier and more commonly than females. Um, if you are older, it can happen. If you are, uh, if you are black, Afro-Americans have a higher risk of heart disease. Uh, Russians also have bad genes for heart disease. Because yeah, the question is picking good grandparents. You know, because a lot of this is, is in you, is bred in your genes. Um, you could get a sex change, but by the time that's done, it's already too late. The other things are things like diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, fatty diet, sedentary lifestyle. They say that the recliner chair is the new pack of cigarettes. Certainly smoking. Smoking is the biggest single thing you can do. Stopping smoking is the biggest single thing to improve uh, your risk of heart disease. Does that include uh, like this marijuana with well, the marijuana, new Marijuana laws. doesn't have nicotine. Uh -huh. It doesn't have the tars that affect your lungs. I mean, it's not good for you, but it's not causing the same. Nicotine constricts your blood vessels. Right. That's like, you know, when sometimes you smoke, you, your hands could get nuts. But what cold. about the smoke? The well, the smoke is the same as breathing the air in New York. You know, okay. there's a certain amount of, of dust and things like that. Um, there's nothing like cigarettes. There's nothing like tobacco. Even um, vapes. People, you know, vapes were originally introduced as a way to get off of mm -hmm. cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But now it's become primary. It's a nicotine delivery tool. They, the, the, Nicotine, the tobacco companies, Altria, you know, which is Philip Morris, um, they've all now bought into the vape companies because it's a way to deliver tobacco, a way to deliver nicotine. So the nicotine is in the vape. Right, right, right. That's, just, that's not good. Duh. Well, now the, other, now the, the good side, though, is if you um, give up cigarettes, cigarettes, in addition to cardiac disease, you'll get emphysema, toughening of the sacs in the lungs. You can get lung cancer, you can get throat cancer. Mm -hmm. um, that's because of the tars, the burning products in tobacco. You still have the risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, but you're trading away emphysema, uh, lung cancer. So vape is better than, but better than that is to not do, to not do nicotine, not do tobacco. And it's hard. People who've done heroin or cocaine have said that it was easier to stop heroin or cocaine than it was to stop cigarettes. It's very hard. Is it targeted uh, mainly with the uh, younger people that start well, with the Well, if smoking? you're in the business, you want to get young people. We're in the environmental business. What do we always want to do? We want to get kids to come out to the cleanups because we're not going to be here forever. So the same thing. As people get hit, people get wise. Smoking has dropped by 30 40% over the last couple of years. So they need a new market. So they need to find kids. So, and that's why there's a discussion about the new vapes. They're uh, fruit flavored, yeah. you know, and they're attractive to kids. I didn't know there was nicotine in it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that's, it's a nicotine okay. delivery system. Because tobacco, cigarettes are passe. I mean, if you smoke cigarettes now, you're like, Nobody people look down on you. You have to go outside the building and mm. all that. But, but by vaping, 
you know, no one even knows. So the tobacco companies have moved wholesale into that. The big message, though, about risk factors is that there are things you can change and some you can't. I, you can't change your race, you can't change, you can't control your age, you can't control your sex. But if you have high blood pressure, get to the doctor, get on your meds, lose some weight. Um, same thing, diabetes. Um, we have an obesity uh, epidemic and the obesity epidemic is leading people into back pain, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, diabetes, mm. and um, you know, it's calories in, calories out. It's tough, it's a tough issue. But the thing, the message is, if you're a diabetic, control your diabetes. If you can keep your sugar within normal range, you don't necessarily have to get the, the, the sequela that people get, people with amputations and blindness. You don't have to get those side effects of the diabetes if you rigidly control your, your sugar level where it's supposed to be. So it's important to no uh, question. get the, you know, the blood work done when you see uh, the doctor. Yeah, know where you stand. Um, and, and see, I always tell people in CPR class, if you want to be healthy when you're 75, don't wait, to, don't wait until you're 72 to figure that out. You start today. Mm. You start today. And it's sometimes it's simple as walking. Get up, walk around the block. Walk around the block. Next week, walk two blocks and build up. Walking is the, probably the best exercise you can do. And when you do that, that lowers your appetite, helps you control the weight. You build pulmonary reserve. You, you exercise the heart. The heart's a muscle, and you can make the heart stronger. So, but what happened is that now here's somebody who didn't, and now you may not have any cardiac disease. You may just suddenly go into fibrillation even without it. But the message is if you stack the deck the wrong way, you're certainly at a higher risk. So what happens to some of these people when it snows, they have the shovel and they, they do too much? Well, what like holiday that? hard. You know, right, right around Christmas and New Year's, people are, 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 are eating more than they used to, they're drinking more than they used to, they're under a lot of stress, and now mm. it snows. Y this guy who's sat, sedentary lifestyle, has been sitting in a recliner, now he goes out. It's like the weekend athlete. Sometimes people go out and they push, them, push themselves, you know, beyond their regular limits. So what happens if you have a heart attack, you have a blockage, the heart gets irritable. Um, when tissue breaks down, it releases their contents and the sodium and the potassium hit the surrounding tissues. The heart gets irritable. If you're low on oxygen, the heart gets irritable. When that happens, it sets off these escape pacemakers. They all start to fire at once and the heart quivers and shakes and you're in fibrillation. You are officially dead. When you're in fibrillation, <laughs> ventricular, wow. now there are people who have atrial fibrillation where the top of the heart quivers. You can have that for 10 or 20 years. You can manage it. You can have an ablation. You can go see the electrophysiology people. Um, and some people just live with it. Atrial fibrillation you could have for a long time. Ventricular fibrillation you have about five or 10 minutes. What happens when you are fibrillating, there's a graph of success over time. If you're on a monitored bed in the emergency room and we see you go into fibrillation, whoa, clear, <laughs> slap the pads, clear, <laughs> and deliver a shock. If I shock you in the first minute, there's an 80, 90% chance you'll convert to a normal rhythm. But the heart gets weaker and weaker and poopier and poopier. And five minutes in, it's a 50-50 shot. 10 minutes of ventricular fibrillation, without CPR, without a shock, nobody survives. Now, when I was a baby nurse, big scared eyes, freshly scrubbed face, everybody who coded, everybody who went to cardiac arrest got a full hour long code. It's, it's the golden hour, he gets the whole hour. It's his last hour and we'd empty the drug box and we'd be shocking, flat line and um, what percentage of the population got better after an hour long code? Not too much. <laughs> Zippo. What we learned is fib is a finite phenomenon. It lasts, unassisted, five or ten minutes. And it's not like you have five or ten minutes and then it drops off the table. Every minute you delay, you lose ten percent of the possibility the person's going to get better. And that's why a big <coughs> issue tonight, what we want to talk about is defibrillation. Automated external defibrillators. Because CPR didn't work. CPR, the way we know it, is about 50 years old and the f 50, 60 years old. The first 40 years, it didn't really work. We thought, oh, now watch, we're gonna pump and blow, pump and blow, pump and blow, and nobody's ever gonna have to die again because we're gonna put oxygen in and pump it around. Um, oh, how sad. <laughs> but the big myth is uh, people are afraid. A lot of people are afraid. W what's the, uh, the percentile well, now? Is it, are oh, more it's people? grim. It's very grim. Of the number of people who do CPR, the number of people who survive. Um, 
the, the point, though, about fibrillation, let me just finish that point, is that CPR was ABC. Open the airway, breathe the victim, do compressions. Mm -hmm. Airway, breathing, circulation. Pump and blow, yeah. pump and blow, pump and blow. But it missed the point. It missed the point. What we're probably going to die of is ventricular fibrillation. And I can say that with some authority because it's the single biggest cause of death in America. Heart attack and cancer keep fighting for number one, number two. But treatment's gotten better, screening has gotten better. Cancer rates are starting to slow down. But because of the obesity crisis, smoking, mm. um, heart disease has gone up. Our sedentary lifestyle. You know, used to be, we used to work on the docks and pick stuff up and move around. Um, and now, on the computer all the time. We're not, you need to get up, you need TV. to take a break, get up, walk around. So, um, but what happened around 2000, ABC changed. ABC became ABCD. Up until then, if you want to shock somebody, you had to be a doctor, a nurse, a paramedic, a PA, somebody with advanced training and credentials, and, or maybe a bus driver, or maybe a Boy Scout. Because AEDs, by, with space age technology, miniaturization, electronics, we were able to shrink down a doctor, and put a doc in a box, read the EKG. See, I could teach you to read an EKG and know when there's a shockable rhythm. And we could do it in an hour or two. And I could go over rhythms and you'd say, oh, okay, I understand that. Now you don't use it, six weeks later, it's gone, it's gone. Sure. But this is a robot. This is no smarter than anybody in the room, but it's a robot. It never forgets. It has no ego. It doesn't have any attitude. It doesn't, uh, it just, it's just there. It's a computer. Is you put the information in. Is it a program? Yeah, there's a, there are computer chips in there okay. that read the EKG. Uh -huh. What it does, it looks at the morphology, morphos, body, from the Greek. The morphology of an EKG wave. And by knowing the shape of the wave, how fast it's going, mm. it says this is a shockable rhythm. This heart's out of control. This heart's running through open fields. Everybody stand clear, charging, and the orange button will light up and deliver the shock. And, and it's a magical thing. It really is a magical thing. Uh, my business, um, my wife and I train people in CPR. And um, we trained about 1,000 people a year. So we started in like 1990. Um, after 10 years, you would think the phone would be ringing off the hook because there's 10,000 people with a card in their back pocket that says Tony Rose on it. No, Tony, we saved another one. Tony brought a guy back. Tony, this guy was dead. But after about 10 years, I'm like the Maytag man. You know, they never call, they never write. There are a couple of people who got heimlich you're not, you're not allowed to say Heimlich now unless you pay money. So people suffered a foreign body airway obstruction. Um, but in terms of he was dead, now he's not. There wasn't really a lot of that. So you don't get the calls? Well, what yes. happened at around 2000, 1998, 2000, mm -hmm. the rules changed. ABC became ABCD. In the first 10 years, not a single out of hospital save. In the last 20, last 15 years, there are 26 people in New York, New Jersey, two in Aruba, who have no idea who Tony Rose is. But my peeps, all my CPR children, are out there saving my CPR grandchildren. There are 26 people who were dead who are alive because somebody who was in one of my classes was in the right place in the right time. 20 of the 26 saves are AED related. ABC became ABCD and now it started to work. So this is just a magical, magical thing. So the people that were saved, did they have one of those devices on them? It's a matter of luck. Right place, right time. Um, the numbers, well, where do you think is the safest place? If you could pick the time and place, little Karnak action, Karnak speaks. Where is the safest place to go into sudden cardiac arrest? Where's the best place for your heart to go into fibrillation and stop? No. People say, a hospital, Tony Rose's house, or maybe. Um, the safest place, statistically, based on time and date stamped video evidence, is a casino in Las Vegas. Like, what? Because oh, the God old. is watching. 
The casinos okay. have bought into CPR and automated defibrillators. So what happens now, you're in, uh, you're, you're, you're there with the one arm bandit, pressing the buttons, ding, 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 and you, you start to get chest pain. You sit back, start to breathe heavy. Now there's a guy in a console room with 20 video monitors, and the first thing they notice is you stop putting wampum bucks in, okay? And so he zooms in on you, and you slump in the chair, and before you slide to the floor, there's a security guard on the way. Chucky, yeah, go to table 17. Yeah, pick up an AED on the way. And before you hit the carpet, there's a security guard with a pocket mask in one hand and an AED in the other. He's going to start CPR. He's going to deliver a shock. The numbers are nationwide. If you clutch your chest in a Costco and down you go, survival in a community is about 5%. So the odds that you are going to get better, go back to your family, go back to work, it's 20 to 1 against you. 95 out of 100 people stay dead. And if you think about it, it's a core question of logistics. It's a question of geography. CPR is a good idea, but it doesn't break FIB. You need a shock. You need a shock. And FIB lasts 5 to 10 minutes. What's the average response time for New York City EMS. It's excellent, actually. It's excellent. But what do you think? What's the number for a critical care response call? It's not 10 minutes. Well, no, it's 5 to 10 minutes. Is it? Yeah, the average is 5 to 10 minutes, like 7 minutes and 35 seconds, something like that. And it goes up, up and down a couple seconds, and they jigger it. But it's 5 to 10 minutes, and EMS is a wonderful system. But they have to get in there and find you. And well, that's the whole question. The it's geography. They're not okay. sitting on every street corner. Right. EMS handles 3,500 calls every day. On a hot summer day in August, twice that. And they're excellent, excellent people. They're well-trained, they're well-equipped, but it's just a question of geography. There's, um, there's a study going on in, um, I think, Denmark, where a graduate student has put an AED into a drone. And you call 911, and GPS tells them where you are. They pull up a map on their 911 thing, and a drone comes out to the front of your house. You bring the drone in, you slap on the pads, and the AED does the rest. Eventually, you know, right, yeah, right now we can get our, our bedroom slippers from Amazon by drone. Um, but eventually that's the way we're headed. And, and more and more, um, AEDs are starting to happen. AED has been slow to take place because a lot of people are afraid. Um, so the survival out in the community because EMS just can't get to you in that first five minutes. It's about 5%. In a hospital, survival is about 15%. Five to one. Better, but still pretty grim. If you drop in a casino with CPR and AED, there's a 33% survival rate. A little and, higher. And that's phenomenal. When you think this is a person who was dead, they were dead. Because when you're in fibrillation, well, there's two kinds of dead. There's actually a lot of kinds of dead. The two kinds of dead we're dealing with right now, you've just gone into fibrillation, you collapse. You're not moving, you're not breathing, you have no pulse, you don't laugh at the jokes, you are dead. Legally, morally, undeniably dead. Okay, but your tissue's still warm. If we put an EEG on your head, I'd see you still have brainwave activity. So parts of you are excellent, but it's not gonna last because the tissue slowly, slowly dies. Okay. Now, CPR won't break fibrillation, but what it will do is pick up the oxygen that's in your body, deliver it to your heart, deliver it to your brain, and keep those tissues viable. See, right now you're in what's called clinical death. You have no life signs. Your mm -hmm. tissue's still alive, but you have no life signs, and it's not going to last long. If we don't do CPR, if we don't get you a shock, your heart gets weaker and weaker and poopier and poopier, and it goes from fibrillation to flatline. Now, fib to flatline, asystole, no systolic beats, asystole is flatline. And that's tissue death, biological death, and that's irreversible. So you're in this little time capsule, and I can keep you suspended in time by doing good CPR. And if I can get a shock to you, I can bring you back from the dead. And that's like, let's take a second with that. That's amazing. I can take someone who's dead and bring them back to life. Doesn't happen often often enough, but more and more and more every day. You're looking in the paper. Some woman dropped on a sidewalk. Two cops driving along saw her. They did CPR. A woman from a storefront charter school came out with an AED, shocked them back to life. I did a class, my wife and I did a class at the Westerly um, Tennis Club 
Okay. And because um, we're in a ballroom dance association, and the officers from ballroom dance hooked us up with the Westerly Club, and about 16 people took CPR, and it's an enjoyable day. It's an enjoyable uh, uh, event, fun with dead people. And um, about a month later, the woman who's the president of the ballroom club said, "Tone, Tone, I want to tell you, one of the guys in the tennis club was at the dockside, was at a uh, restaurant in Great Kills, mm -hmm. and he heard a noise behind him, and a guy fell out of the chair." dropped dead. So he started doing CPR and the doc side has an AED. They brought the AED to the patient's side, delivered the shock. By the time Emus got there, the guy was looking around. He was back from the dead. I'd love to get them all together, you mm -hmm. know, to do a story of that. Absolutely. That's just, it's just, it's a very goosebumpy time to be in the business because now we're starting to see things happen. People still don't learn CPR. Why? What are the two reasons? Why don't you think people learn CPR? Well, first of all, the, uh, the myth that you have to put your, your face. Well, cooties. Yeah. Cooties are a major okay. uh, reason why people don't think they want to do this. They, they're not trained properly either. Well, people mm -hmm. who've just seen this on TV have been able to do CPR and bring people back. It's good. But they're afraid. What are the other thing they're afraid of? Lawyers. Cooties and lawyers. Those are the two big impediments. Uh, and it's my job as a CPR instructor to explain to people that that's not an issue. First, cooties are not an issue because now we're doing what's called hands-only CPR. What we mentioned before is that there's oxygen all over your body right now. If you go to the doctor, they put a pulse ox on, mm -hmm. and the laser beam is refracted through the hemoglobin, and it says how much oxygen is in your bloody, in your body. There's oxygen in your nose. There's oxygen in your toes. It's all over. All right, when you go into fibrillation, you stop pumping blood, but your tissues still have oxygen in them. Half the blood in your body is full of oxygen that was headed to replace the oxygen that you're using now. Your last breath is still in your lungs. If I could get that blood moving, redistribute that oxygen to your heart, to your brain, I can take that five or ten minutes of fib and maybe make it 15 or 20. So you're still in the game when EMS arrives. So compressions only CPR is a good thing. And you don't have to do mouth to mouth. At some point you will desaturate that oxygen. You'll have to add breath. But by then, EMS comes. They've got a breathing bag. Um, the laws, a lot of the laws about CPR in New York City, all over, started in Staten Island. The first law, about 20 years ago, Fred Cerullo was a city councilman. And he realized, oh, you know, no one's doing CPR. Yeah, still. Uh, maybe because they need CPR equipment. They're afraid of cooties. Okay, so he said that every public place must have CPR equipment. Okay, mm -hmm. a pair of gloves and a protective breathing device. This is called a pocket mask. It's got a one-way valve. You put it over the victim's face, you blow in it. Air goes into the victim. When the victim exhales, the air blows away from you, so you're protected against oh. exhaled air, aerosolized particles, bazooka barf, you know, any of the possible exigencies of CPR. So. Now, it started as local law number 12, a New York City law. It's now statewide law. When I go to heart association uh, conferences all over the country, I keep copies of local law number 12. And I tell them, you know, in New York City, we have this law. Oh, yeah. Get it to your city councilman. Take it to your state assembly person. You should have this law should be all over. Um, so big places like Burger King, um, chain restaurants, because they have corporate lawyers, these things are up on the wall. Mm. Um, so I always tell people in a class that you are deputized to be one of Tony's troublemakers. When you're in a diner, after you eat, after you've gotten your food, I mean, let's not be stupid about it, but afterwards, ask them, gee, where's your CPR equipment? Now, they may think your brother-in-law is a health department inspector. For 20 bucks, they're going to go get a pocket mask. And this, again, could be the difference between doing CPR and not doing CPR, because cooties are an issue. Um, yeah. The other issue is lawyers, and it's my job to explain that lawyers are not an issue. Lawyers are not a problem because if you work in a healthcare facility, if you're in a doctor's office, they spend a lot of money on malpractice insurance. So anything that happens um, is covered by the malpractice insurance. You know, because even even if you do everything the way you're supposed to, and things end up kind of like you thought they were gonna, this is America. And anybody can sue anybody at any time. Now, will they win? No, of course not. But it's a colossal pain having to deal with lawyers and being sued. So, the good, the, so the, in the hospital, there's malpractice insurance. When you're out in the world, there's a law, the Good Samaritan Act. 
and it mm. has a statute number, every state has it. And it says if you're doing something where you know what you're doing, you're doing it in good faith, and basic CPR is simple and easy, and people have just seen it on TV. You, you don't necessarily have to be certified. If you really want to be good at it, you should be certified. Um, so all health care well, professionals. Well, all health care professionals are certified because that's like a legal thing in the hospital. Yeah. And everybody else should. Everybody else should. Everybody else. See, I go to like the, the, the a Rotary or I go to Knights of Columbus and I'll do a survey. I'll say, all right, how many people think CPR is a good idea? And 50 hands go up. Great. That's wonderful. How many people think that everybody ought to know the life-saving skills of CPR? 50 hands go up. Excellent. Excellent. What a group. All right, pull out your wallets, look at it, pull your CPR cards out, show me how many people are certified. Kind of look away, huh? Uh, it's kind of sad, it's kind of sad. Everybody thinks CPR is a good idea for somebody else to do. But in a two hour, depends on the, the kind of course, civilian CPR is about two and a half hours. Two and a half hours and you could save a life. The saddest thing is you see on the TV news, the family says, Oh, you know, if only we knew what to do before this happened, that would have been nice. Yeah, it would have been. Maybe this, it wouldn't have ended the way it did. And it's, it's really not hard. Um, somebody, when we did, the, we did our ballroom dance club, we did a class for the ballroom dance people, and a woman said, well, what if I fail this tonight? What if I fail CPR? I said, honey, I've been training for 25 years. If you were to fail tonight, you would be the first. Because what we're going to do, the only two grades in heart association programs are pass and yet to pass. We're going to lock the door until you show a competency. I'm That's not going to let you walk out without knowing how to do it. We've had people with cerebral palsy uh, do CPR. Uh, I have a blind CPR instructor. Um, you really have yeah. to hand it to him. When he's monitoring, he puts his hand on the chest to make sure that the chest is rising when you breathe. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, 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 remember th uh, when thalidomide in the 50s and 60s, people were born like with no arms. At the Helen Keller Institute, they were training thalidomide um, patients how to do CPR with their feet, how to do chest compressions with their feet. So there's nobody who can't do CPR. Um, do some CPR, because some CPR is better than no CPR. Even if you're afraid you're not doing it right, bad CPR, by definition, is better than no CPR. And some True. CPR may be enough to make that difference to keep the person viable until EMS arrives. So we're, we're deeply into this thing. Maybe we can do a little let's demonstration. Show, let's, show, let's show the kids how it's done. Okay. So what we're going to do is called whole part whole. Um, so, okay, if you turn on the TV right now, law and order is going to come up. All right, sure. everybody knows how law and order, every episode starts the same. Here you are, strolling through the grounds at Hudson University, you're in the quad, and you hear, dunk, dunk. <gasps> oh my God, oh my God. Now CPR, is, there's three steps. The first step is scene safety. First rule I learned in the emergency room mm. is don't hurt the nurse, okay? Um, don't hurt the nurse, because you're not good to anybody else if you're in trouble, okay? So the first thing is scene safety. Is she laying on electrical wire? Okay, is there uh, poison gas? Are there bullets flying? Is the shooter changing clips? Make sure it's safe to do this, okay? Somebody's pinned under a car and a vehicle's on fire. Come on, come on, come on, okay? So the first step, scene safety. Next step, activate your emergency response system. I'm gonna check, I'm gonna tap and shout and see if they're responsive. Hey, hey, she's unresponsive. Now maybe she's a drug overdose. Maybe she had a seizure. Seizure, the scariest thing to see in all of medicine. But you don't die of seizures, all right, unless, unless your airway gets blocked. The most common obstruction, the most common obstruction in an unconscious person is the tongue. Now, the tongue's a wonderful organ. It does all kinds of wonderful things. We love it. But when you're unconscious, it's just another big floppy muscle. Your eyes and lids are limp, your arms are limp, your jaw sags, and like a garage door, your tongue falls to the back of the throat and blocks the airway, okay? So that may be why she's unconscious. She had a seizure and now she's not breathing. But at unconscious, I don't worry if she's alive or dead yet. Mm -hmm. Right now what I want to do is call 911. Get on the phone, call 911, stay on the phone, go into the administration building in the front lobby, there's an AED. Tell the clerk at the desk, you need the AED. So get help right away. Phone first, phone fast, phone 911. Otherwise you'll be doing CPR for the rest of your life, waiting for help. Phone first, phone fast. 
get an AED if there's an AED available. Now I'll do my CPR assessment. What I want to do is see are there any signs of life. This is called the head tilt chin lift. And when I do this, when a baby's choking, when you were sitting in a high chair choking, what did, um, what did grandma say to you? Put the head, look up, look up, look at the light, look at the bird, hands up, all kinds of things like that. What happened? First thing babies learn is grown ups lie. You don't see no damn bird. No birds. Okay, but he lifted his head up, that pulls his jaw forward, pulls the tongue out of occlusion, <coughs> and now he can hack out that cheesy chunk. So the first thing you do, I'm opening the airway. If I open the airway, I lift the tongue forward, and now this lady goes, oh, we're done here. She's breathing. Breathing is a sign of life. You can't breathe if you're not alive. She's breathing every five or six seconds like you are. We're done here, okay? What I'll do is, if I'm not worried about a neck injury, I'm gonna roll her on her side, okay? I'm gonna watch and make sure her chest keeps rising, she keeps breathing, because that's how I know she's alive, okay? Um, and every five or six seconds, she's gonna take a breath. Now, if that didn't happen, I'm looking for signs of life. I open the airway, I check for breathing, I'm looking for movement, coughing, I'll pinch her and see, does she respond to pain? But I got no response, I have no breathing, there's nothing happening here. So what I'm gonna do is start compressions. You make a line between the nose and the navel, and another line at the nipple line. Where those lines cross is the center of the chest. And at its simplest, Heart Association says, put your hands in the center of the chest, push hard, push fast. That's it. That's CPR. For how long, though? Well, if the patient gets better, stop. Okay. Okay. Get them. That's a sign of life. Stop. If somebody with an equal or higher level, if EMS comes, they're going to take over. Mm. Now, maybe they're going to get an IV. They're going to get the monitor on board. So I'll keep doing compressions. They'll have a breathing bag, and they'll breathe the victim. Okay? Um, so I see somebody down. Is it safe to be here? Tap and shout. Hey, hey, lady, lady, lady. Oh, man. Call 911. Go get the AED. There's nothing happening here. So I'm going to do 30 compressions and two breaths because I have a protective breathing device. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 compressions. I have a pocket mask in my backpack, a protective breathing device. Pointed piece goes on the nose, a rounded piece goes on the chin. That head tilt chin lift, I'm going to clamp the mask, extend the head. The lungs fill and then the chest rises. As soon as the chest rises, stop breathing. Two breaths. And then back to that center of the chest, lower half of the breastbone, at least two inches. No more than two and a half, but about two inches. Press till it feels right. And I'm going to do 30 compressions, 27, 28, 29, 30, and two breaths. Now the Heart Association says to keep you on track, sing a song. They like staying alive, staying alive. Uh, uh, uh. In some places, it's bunk, bunk, bunk. Another one bites the dust. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 compressions and two breaths. I'm gonna do this without checking for five cycles. Two minutes of C, if you're gonna come back with just CPR, you're coming back in the first minute or two. So 30 and two and 30 and two and 30 and two and 30 and two and 30 and two. Two minutes later, I stop for no more than 10 seconds and I look and see. Is there, she's starting to squirm her butt. She's opening and closing her hands. Ooh, 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 that's a sign of life, okay? Any purposeful activity means she's alive. But what happens, so the heart, whatever happened, she may have had fibrillation and it spontaneously broke. Could happen. Mm -hmm. She might have um, passed out, her tongue blocked her airway, and with no oxygen, her heart slowed, slowed, slowed almost to a stop. But when I put oxygen back in, the heartbeat came back. But the brain controls breathing, so I'm gonna check for breathing. And if she's not breathing, it's called rescue breathing. I'm, every time I take a breath, I give it to the victim. I make sure she's still flipping her leg, making sure she still has signs of life, her color has gotten better. And every five or six seconds, I give a breath. If she should start breathing on her own, cool, wonderful, magical. We're back to the recovery position. Experienced providers tend to roll the victim facing away. Okay, but we'll put her on the side, get a jacket, get a backpack, support her head, Bend one leg, keep her on her side. Now the tongue flops to one side, secretions can drool out. It's a magical thing. It's a beautiful thing. What happens if somebody's drowning? Just to CPR. Dr. Heimlich said, do the Heimlich, get water out of the lungs. There is no water in the lungs. When you drop into a pool, your airway goes into laryngospasm. It's called a dry drowning. You very rarely get water in your lungs. You will swallow water, 
but there's very little water in the lungs. Once you pull somebody out, you look for signs of life. If you're not seeing it, pump and blow, pump and blow, pump and blow. Now, if I don't have a protective breathing device, another option, um, excuse me, what I carry around for portability and convenience is a rescue key. This is an impermeable plastic barrier. I did my 30 compressions, and inside here is a plastic shield like a surgical mask. It's got a built-in one-way valve. So I put it over the victim's face, and now I can do mouth to mouth. I pinch the nose, and I breathe in. Air goes through the one-way valve into the victim. When the victim exhales, air blows out through the side instead of back into your face. So you protect it. Right, right. And that's the first rule we said, don't hurt the nurse. So ABC has now become CAB. We open up with compressions. The first intervention is going to be compressions. And if you don't have a protective breathing device, then just do compressions. Compressions works because there's air in the body. If you distribute that oxygen, you keep the person in clinical death, keep them from going to tissue death. Mm -hmm. And then when EMS comes, we're going to do something. Or you come back now with the AED. Let's look at an AED. AED, automated external defibrillator. So. What we're gonna do is turn it on. The first thing to do when I have an AED is turn it on. It takes a couple seconds to boot up. So you're still doing the compressions and I'm gonna open a close up so that I can get at the and chest. That, that There's the pictures on the pads that tell you, right side of the breastbone, left armpit line. Because the heart is just off to the left side of the center of the chest. So you wanna make bookends and go from the hot lead to the ground. So. I peel one pad off, and you keep doing compressions while this is going on. Right side of the breastbone, and then left armpit line. Connect electrodes. Okay, so this goes under the arm so we can make bookends of the heart. If, um, as, soon as, as soon as the pads are in place, the machine senses um, an EKG. Stand now clear. we get back. Keep doing CPR until it says analyzing. Now, now it's Stand reading the EKG. Clear comparing it to its library of shockable rhythms. If it thinks it's a shockable Shock rhythm, advised. well, the bad news is he's in fib, but the good news is she's in fib, because I can fix that. So the button's gonna light up. Stand clear. I'm clear, you're clear. Make sure everybody is safe, and the shock is delivered, all right? Soon as the shock is delivered, what do we do? We get back on the chest and continue CPR. Don't you check a pulse? Don't you check a rhythm? Don't, no. What happens? What shock does, when your computer gets the blue screen of death, critically unstable, when your computer locks up, how do you fix it? You restart it. Yeah, you have to shut it down. And that's what happens. When the heart's out of control, people think that the shock jump starts the heart or boosts the heart. What it does, it stuns the heart. It fires every muscle fiber at the same time. Now they all stop at the same time, and now the heart's normal pacemaker says, oh, I can get in there now, and the normal beat could kick back in and that's how it works. It reboots the heart, it stops the heart. So as soon as the shock is delivered, you get back on the chest, it's now erased that bad rhythm, and the normal rhythm could kick back in, but that's gonna take a minute or so. So we do compressions, and then somewhere along the way, if we see signs of life, let's go back and reassess. So AEDs <coughs> are the difference between CPR working and CPR not working. Uh, can somebody buy something like this? What, how do you get something like that? Um, Couple places, uh, AEDSuperstore.com is probably the cheapest to get a new. You get a new AED. It's got a five-year warranty. It comes with a battery. It comes with a set of pads. Now, there's actually an excellent opportunity now for people. They've been around long enough that you can buy a refurbished AED. Um, this is actually my favorite defibrillator. When I was a volunteer with the Heart Association, you weren't allowed, you know, because of conflict of interest and things like that. Um, and I had a box full of trainers. This is a trainer. This is like Fisher Price, my first AED. You know, it makes noise. It, it looks good. You can train with it, but it doesn't really deliver a shock. This is called the, the Philips Onsite. Now, the Onsite is one of the smallest, one of the lightest, one of the smartest devices that's out there. Um, a friend of mine has refurbished AEDs, Scott Carruthers. Uh, has a training center called Training for Life, and it's a not-for-profit uh, operation. And one of the things he does is um, does training in schools, and he got a bunch of AEDs, um, and he's refurbished them, and he gives an AED to the schools, and he trains the teachers how to do CPR. Some of them he sells to buy pads and batteries to refurbish the other units. So um, 
There's information, training for life. Um, Scott Carruthers has, um, if you send an email to AED at training numeral four life, Dot org and the numbers are on the screen there's an 877 number um, you can find out more information because what's really excellent in New York State when these first came out community AEDs were three thousand dollars so New York State passed the law said that if you buy an AED not a doctor or a dentist who needs them for business mm -hmm. but you buy an AED to make the community safer we're gonna give you a five hundred dollar tax credit not a deduction but a full tax credit if you don't owe any money they don't owe you money, they're gonna send you a check for 500 bucks. If you owe 1,500 on your state taxes, you're only gonna owe 1,000. It's the IT250 is a form your tax guy knows. So okay. you can get an AED, you buy an AED for $500, it's referred with a two year warranty, and then when you do your taxes, you have your tax guy take the serial number, put it in an IT250, and you get the money back. So it, it's essentially a free AED. And the more AEDs are out there, the safer, you're going to be, the safer I'm going to be. That's why I always tell people, the reason I teach CPR is that the more people who could save Tony Rose, the better the planet would be. See, now this one, this device, now this is an actual real AED. In fact, if I drop, remember, the one in the red case. Got it. Take the one in the red case. Oh. Now, but the cool thing about this device is that I can buy training pads and turn this into a trainer. I can make this do tricks. Right here, right now, this will only sh shock if you drop and you go into fibrillation. But I can take the clinical pads out, put the training pads in. Adult now I can make it, pads. now training. I can make it, I can in make it do tricks. Emergency. I can make it rhyme. Scenario, scenario, scenario three. I can make it rap. Scenario one. Okay, so now this is set up now as a trainer. Since it uses the actual circuitry, of the um, defibrillator, we're gonna put this um, training strip here so that the pads can talk to each other. So we're doing CPR, we're doing our chest compressions, the AED arrives. Like a fire alarm, it says pull, pull. So we're gonna pull the lid off. That's gonna expose Again, the pads. By removing all clothing I'll take the, the pads off. Cut clothing and the pictures tell me, right side of the breastbone, the Keep doing the chest the compressions pad. while this is going on. Exactly the training videos tell you, the put the sticky Press side towards the patient. The Once the pads are in place, the machine no reads the EKG. Everybody's the back. Everybody's Analyzing. off. It takes, it looks like forever, but it takes five to eight seconds to analyze, read no the rhythm. should touch the patient. Analyzing. Shock advised. Okay. Stay clear of patient. Press the flash so I'm clear, button. you're clear, everybody's clear. Let's deliver our shock. Shock delivered. Sometimes they jump, sometimes they don't. What do we do as Be soon as the shock is delivered? Keep doing Get the back CPR. on the chest. Do it's compressions. Safe. Now, okay. if you're good safe. at compressions, Begin you're good at your CPR, CPR. then just do For it. help with CPR, press the flashing blue button. This will tell you one and a half minutes to next analysis. One minute to next analysis. But let's say this is at church. This is at school, and nobody really knows how to do this really well. Hit the info button. Place the heel of one hand Machine's gonna walk in you through the it. center of the chest between the nipples. Place your other hand on top of the first. Push the chest How, down how deep, a wise machine? Inches. How fast? Keep time with the beat. A nice polka. Get you the rhythm. So it's gonna walk you through it. It's calm, it's relaxed. It helps you stay calm and relaxed. And if you lose track of how many compressions, don't worry about it. Because the machine's counting for you. After 30 compressions, tilt head and give two full breaths. Breathe. Break, fresh air. Breathe. Continue with compression. And then back on the chest and go. So this is going to give you two minutes to do CPR. Okay? Um, it's going to do five cycles, two minutes. After two minutes, if you forget how many cycles, this remembers. After five cycles, this is stand clear, analyzing. So, you can keep going with it. Well, let's, let's see what happens. We just did two minutes of CPR after we delivered a shock. Now the machine comes back and says, no shock advised. Is that good or is that bad? No shock advised. Is that good or is that bad? That's good. Maybe. The answer is yes, it's good or it's bad. If um, you got an organized rhythm, the machine doesn't need to shock. And it won't shock. It's shut up to shock ventricular fibrillation. If you go to flatline, It'll say no shock advised too. 
because there's no point shock at flatline. So you need to be able to check the, the victim and see how they're doing. Are they better or are they worse? Because if they're the same, it'll shock them again. If they get better, it won't shock. If they get worse, it won't shock. Okay, we have, how many minutes we have, to, uh, Charlie? About three minutes left. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is a very important for uh, saving lives, restoring lives. Um, it's good for the environment for people that want to stay alive. So, you know, last thought about if you were interested in uh, going to one of the training um, classes. I, I do. Well, I also do guest speaker, uh, AARP <coughs> folks. Uh, oh. we're, we're having a lot of fun with the AARP people. Yeah. Uh, I have a website, cprwithtonyrose.com. And on the website, there's an email link, or the email directly is um, CPR with Tony Rose, easy enough to remember, at gmail.com. Um, we had Scott's information there. Find out more about getting an AED because I want you to have an AED. I think everybody sh should have one. You know. Uh, now, oh, big, big issue, though, before we close down, is every AED needs a mommy or a daddy. One of the most critical issues. Little League buys an AED, puts it in the closet above the deep fryer in a snack shack. Two, three years later, Grandpa collapses on field number two, and the director at the site says, all right, start CPR, go to the snack shack. In the closet above the deep fryer, there's an AED. What about battery life? And no one has looked at it. Every two years, you need a new set of pads. The pads last two years, they need to be replaced. Okay, Every pads? four years, you need to replace the battery. It comes to about maybe $100 a year. Every two years, you do the pads. At the four-year mark, you replace the pads again and get a fresh battery. Even if you haven't used them? They oxidize, they oh, get old, they get dry and crunchy. Okay. And that's a big issue. That's why I tell people, when you get an AED, put a little card. Because this has self-check. It checks itself. It's self-maintenance. And if there's a problem, it'll beep. And when you hit the blue button, it'll say, low battery, pads inoperable, whatever the problem is. There's a little LED in the corner. And uh, you might be able to see it. If that well, LED is flashing, Every two minutes, every every five seconds, it yeah. means the machine has checked itself, checked the circuitry, checked its battery, checked the pads. It's ready to rock and roll. So you should check it and make a little note that when it in January I checked it. Okay. It's flashing. The pads are in date. The battery's good. And in February I'm going to do it again. Okay, Tony. Wow, an hour went by fast. So much and so so much info and so, such little time. So I want to thank you for being on the show. I hope people... I had a good time. Annie had a good time. He always has a good time, wherever he goes. And February is Heart Month. Well, that's okay. the, one of the reasons we scheduled this. February is Heart Month, which means go find yourself uh, a CPR class. Okay. Google CPR class. CPRwithtonyrose.com. Um, the American Heart Association, heart.org, has a course finder. You can type in the class you want, and they'll give you the information of, of the training centers within 20 miles of you that offer it. Okay. We're, we're just about out of here. I thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. I okay. appreciate this opportunity. To, maybe we can save some lives. There we go. People Environmental, will call you. too. Okay. Well, if they save lives, they're going to be able to do a beach cleanup. See you next month. <laughs>